Welcome, Dr. Mimi Huang, or Dr. Mimi. I'm so, so happy to have a conversation with you today. Me too. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Absolutely. Um, so maybe um, we can just start out. You know, I wanted to bring you in here because I feel like you've got some great knowledge, some great expertise on bisexuality and bisexual mental health. So maybe you can start by um, talking a little bit about how you developed your expertise on bisexuality and maybe some of the things that you've done uh, with that expertise. Absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, my story has different layers to it. Um, as you know, you know, I wear different hats uh, as a psychologist and educator and community organizer. So um, it starts off with just my own coming out journey. Uh, you know, I was an immigrant, uh, a refugee from Vietnam, and uh, I am ethnically Chinese and Vietnamese, so Asian American, but you know, a blend of cultures as it is, and came to the US very young, grew up uh, with you know, very little. My family had to start from scratch. And uh, you know, they really were very traditional in their upbringing uh, for me. And so I really had so little awareness about anything other, other than heteronormativity growing up. And so I just really had no clue that even there was a B in LGBT at the time. Um, and this was in the late 80s, early 90s, you know, before the internet and all of that. So it wasn't until I got to college where I started to learn a little bit more about, you know, uh, sexualities. And um, I was a women's studies minor, a psych major. And so I started learning about, you know, different um, sexual orientations and gender expressions. And so that's when I started to really ask myself, oh, maybe this is what I am, uh, because I'd always been aware of these attractions for uh, females, and I just didn't know where to put it. Uh, it was just something I tucked away because I knew that it was bad um, or different. So it was in college, um, I actually found a really great affirming therapist um, that really helped me talk about these things. And then she connected me with a mentor. Uh, we had an LGBT mentoring program mm -hmm. uh, at my university at UCLA. And so through that mentoring relationship, um, I was able to ask questions and really understand myself and uh, really develop uh, like a template for like what being bi could look like uh, because it was just so new and foreign and different for me. So I came out my senior year uh, in college and uh, started to get involved in different queer groups uh, on campus. And then um, later that same year, this is 1999, I was asked to start a bisexual student group at UCLA. And so that's what started my bi community activism or leadership. Um, and so I co-started this group and it really then helped me find community. And uh, I learned just how hard it was to be out and bi and to find people to accept you and, and all of that. So as I progressed um, you know, in my own schooling, I went to grad school and I got my PhD in clinical psychology. Um, I came uh, back to LA, I moved to San Diego, came back to LA, and there wasn't a, a bisexual group in LA at the time. There was Binet LA that was back in sort of the 80s and 90s. And so at that time I decided, you know, we need a, a, a bi group in Los Angeles. And so at that point I helped to start AMB. Uh, which at the time stood for a meeting of bi individuals, um, is, you know, LA's bisexual social community. And now it's been rebranded to am bi, like I am bi. And uh, it's grown to different cities, states, and all of that's been really great. Um, so that was 2006. And then in 2008, I helped to start the Los Angeles Bi Task Force, which is a nonprofit. So we're a 501c3, we promote education, advocacy, cultural enrichment for the bi plus communities in greater LA. 
And I'm still on the board um, of that organization. Um, I'm no longer on the leadership of, of AMBI. Um, but so that also presented different opportunities to do presentations, workshops, you know, et cetera, for both bi plus, straight, and gay uh, audiences. Um, and it started connecting me to the national uh, leaders. And so in 2013, uh, I attended the first White House Bisexual Community Roundtable. Um, but that was just so phenomenal for our community. And um, I presented on bisexual mental health research, you know, at that event. And that's where we discovered these health disparities that were impacting our community. And so when I came back from that, I really felt the need to combine my community organizing with my you know, psychologist background. At that point, I was licensed as a psychologist. So I really wanted to train more therapists and helping professionals on what it meant to be by affirming um, to help uh, our community that was struggling with health and mental health issues. And uh, in 2018, I uh, decided to start a Buy on Life self-empowerment series uh, to help bi bisexual, pansexual, fluid, and queer folks really develop more self-confidence um, and learn ways to advocate for themselves. Wow. You <laughs> have done so much. And you have done so much for bisexual mental health. I, I love the way you've knit together your own experience and your professional training and, and with a recognition of what are the needs of bisexual people and bi community. Uh, so just, I wanna say thank you, first of all, for everything you've done and all the really foundational work that you did in this field. So that's, um, that's, that's fantastic. And, and I really hear in what you're saying that you are listening to what the needs were and that's you know that's what psychologists do um, but it sounds like that really guided your work and and the things that you created from that yeah i mean i try and i think i just drew from my own experience of feeling uh, alone and not receiving help um, and not knowing where to look you know at, during that that time and so i i was so fortunate to find a therapist that was so knowledgeable and accepting and connected me to resources. Yeah. And so I, I think I wanted to try to, you know, replicate that and, um, you know, heard what the community was saying in terms of therapists and health providers not understanding their identity or even having um, biphobic, you know, attitudes and things like that. And um, I just feel like that's where you really want to have a safe space, you know, when you're seeing a health provider, uh, someone who understands and can support you. Yeah. And it sounds like you got some support when you were at UCLA and, and encouragement too, and that that made a big difference for you. Absolutely. You know, I think having a mentor is so great. Um, someone who's, you know, been there and um, can kind of guide you and uh, give you some tips on just how to deal with life and, and negativity that might come your way. Uh, and then also, you know, after creating the bi group at, at UCLA, which was called Fluid, I found a community. Um, and that was so important. I think that's also a part of my uh, Asian American upbringing of, of sort of that collectivistic sense of family and community. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I wanted to create AMBI and um, you know, the LA Bi Task Force later. And so through having all of those resources that helped, I mean, it helped others, but it also helped me at the same oh, time. That's fantastic. And so you've been talking a little bit about some of the insights that, that you gained along the way about how hard it was for bisexual people to, to find other folks and uh, the mental health disparities. Can you talk about those or any other insights that you've gained about bisexual mental health through the work that you've done? Yeah, so uh, identity development, I feel is just one of those things that I have continued to hear about, um, you know, as a, a psychologist, I think we think about identity and, and how that, that, you know, pans out for folks. And that was also my dissertation 
uh, when I was in grad school was looking at bi identity congruence uh, and internalized biphobia and how that impacts infidelity amongst women who are attracted to men and women. And uh, I found some significant results through that dissertation. I found that the more congruent uh, a person's bi identity, the less internalized biphobia they had. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and also the people that were faithful had higher, um, I'm sorry, had had um, less internalized biphobia. And so those are results that I felt were really important in terms of understanding by mental health. Um, and so really helping people have a clearer sense of who they are. You know, I still think that some people still struggle with that, understanding even their own attractions, um, their dating behaviors and their identity labels. Um, and so I think that that's been something that's, you know, I continue to see um, coming out to family. Um, I think that also, you know, I've seen has presented itself, you know, with clients that I work with, with friends, peers, you know, in the community. Um, and it's interesting because nowadays there's more and more just kind of general LGBT visibility, um, and parents now seem a little bit more aware of gay and lesbian and more accepting, mm -hmm. but they're still having issues with the bi, the bi and the pan. Um, and so that's something I've seen um, is, you know, continuing to be an issue. And, you know, looking at, you know, some of the, the research that's come out recently, like from YouGov um, in 2018, the survey, I don't know if you've seen about attitudes towards bisexuality and you know still 40 percent of folks don't think there's anything between gay and straight and 20 percent aren't sure that means only 40 percent of folks really truly believe that bisexuality exists you know and so um why folks are experiencing that in their dating realm as well um, I think it can be challenging of, you know, when do I tell my dating partner? How are they going to respond? Are they going to reject me or even fresh fetishize me um, for being bi? So, and then that can um, translate into things like sexual violence, um, you know, which I, we've seen the statistics, um, but I've definitely heard about it, you know, in my uh, office um, with bi clients who, you know, been sexually assaulted. Um, and a lot of times it's because, you know, people are taking advantage of their bisexuality um, and finding community. I, I also hear a lot of that, that uh, bi plus folks aren't even aware sometimes that there's organizations out there, either locally or nationally. Um, I think that there's just kind of this lack of, of knowing you know, to search for community. And so, you know, those are the, those themes that I, I generally see. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing that. I, I wanna ask you a question about the, the sexual violence and, and intimate partner violence, because I know that, you know, that that's um, dramatically higher for bisexual uh, women and for bisexual men compared to other sexual orientations. And, um, you know, it's hard for us to always know exactly why, because um, we can't do, you know, we're not going to do randomized, you know, uh, research uh, studies of this, but but because you have insights from hearing people's stories and, and as a therapist, I mean, I, I always suspect that um, the higher rates of intimate partner violence are around being easier to isolate people because of lack of community and by negativity in both gay and straight communities, as well as the uh, the by negativity helps to sort of uh, plays into that dynamic of diminishing somebody, um, which makes it easier to sort of isolate and control them and keep them in those relationships. So I was wondering if that resonates in terms of what you see. Yeah, I do see that there's definitely isolation. Um, sometimes there's a, a, a abusive partner will threaten to out um, the bi partner. Um, and so that's a control tactic. Um, other times there's just an assumption that because you're bi, you are, uh, you're sexually more available um, or you're sexually interested in everybody. 
Um, and so that also, I think, um, objectifies um, that partner's bisexuality and um, that partner, that abusive partner, sort of using it um, to their advantage. Yeah. yeah, thank you so much for sort of shedding some more light on that. I think it's such a such a challenging uh, situation. And mm -hmm. I think that the more we can understand it, then, then the better we can do it trying to address it and prevent it. So as from what you've seen, as you think about what bisexual people need, um, what, what do you think those needs are in terms of advocacy, resources, and community? Yeah, that's such a great question. And uh, you know, I think there's still a lot of things that our community needs. Um, you know, I think working from the inside, you know, there's that self-acceptance piece and um, developing by pride, uh, finding community, finding that sense of strength, you know, in numbers, um, you know, because I think when you're, when you're coming out in isolation, uh, it's just harder. Uh, it's harder to understand who you are. You, you just don't feel uh, like you're okay. You feel so different. Um, and you might um, believe what maybe media has put out there, um, you know, about bi folks and TV and movies and, and things like that. So I still think that there's a lot of that, um, you know, inner work um, to, to, to focus on. And then there's, I think, kind of the outer stuff, which is, you know, helping to educate and spread awareness, uh, both in straight and gay you know, groups and, and contexts, um, because I think there's just still biphobia, still by erasure um, that's happening. And so that then, um, you know, leads to bi plus folks just feeling invisible, feeling um, like there's something wrong with them, they're less than, you know, or not included, um, you know, like an LGBT organization or event, a lot of bi plus folks feel this imposter syndrome of, am I queer enough to go? Will I be accepted at the door? Will I be turned away or laughed at? Um, you know, and so there's, there's gonna, there's just still, still work that's out there that needs to be done. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. That's, that's so helpful. That's so helpful. Um, is, is there anything else that you would want people to know about bisexuality or the work that you've done? Yeah, I think one of the things I uh, kind of get at in terms of building that by pride and self-acceptance is um, really targeting those inner beliefs that we have, right? And I always say bisexuality is normal, it's natural, and it's real. You know, and we just don't hear that enough. And maybe it might be self-explanatory to some people, but there's just still a lot of messages out there that say otherwise. Um, but, you know, there's absolutely nothing unhealthy about bisexuality. Um, it's absolutely a natural, uh, just, you know, a variation in human life and love. Um, and it's real, you know, it isn't something that is a phase. It isn't something that, um, you know, is a, a way station from one direction to another. It is a real orientation. Um, and lots of folks are still bisexual, um, you know, after years and years. So, so I just, you know, like to put that out there. And then the other thing is there is community uh, I think you just have to know where to look. Um, you may have to do a little bit more digging, um, you know, but oftentimes, you know, maybe an LGBT center, you know, might have some uh, groups or resources um, or go to some of the, you know, national groups um, and try to find, you know, a local group nearby. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's such, such great guidance. Um, and, and it's true that it's not always as obvious, you know, where, where the resources are for bisexual people. And the thing that I'm really hearing from you is that you also created things. And so it's one of the things that I've been, uh, one of the messages I try to get across to people is you are authorized to create things. Like everybody is authorized <laughs> to create whatever. I, 
after I, you know, I went to the um, 2015 uh, uh, White House um, bisexual um, community policy briefing. And that after that, I came home 2015, 2016, 20, 2015. Okay. So I came home from that and I was like, I want to bring back that sense of community to my own community. And so I started a bisexual discussion group and, you know, it really, anybody can do that in their own community. And so I think you're such a great model for that. And um, just reminding people that, yeah, we can all, if we see a need, we can do something to, to address that need. So, oh, so great. So mm -hmm. great. Um, I know I love following you on on Instagram and everything. So um, so how can people follow and connect with you? You you do so much and offer so many resources and programs and things. So where should people look for you? Yeah, so I do uh, have my website, drmimihuang.com, uh, where I list all of my different events and programs um, and a list of resources um, by uh, Plus Resources. And uh, social media wise, I am on Instagram and Facebook uh, at Dr. Mimi Huang. And so please follow me and um, yeah, keep in touch. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for everything that you've done for Bi Community and Bi Mental Health. It's, it's really inspiring and, um, and generous of you, really, everything that you've done. So thank you so much, Dr. Mimi. Thank you so much, Dr. Israel. It's been so wonderful having you here. And thank you for all of your work as well in the community. Thank you.